Let me invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16, please. Matthew chapter 16. Doing a series of lessons called The Church. Talking about the church. What's the church supposed to be like? I think that we've, we've kind of got the church whacked out a little bit. Someone said, do you, oh, did you guys hear about this church? This one church where the, where the pastor was up preaching and somebody died in the congregation. Did you hear, what, hear about that? Some, the pastor was up preaching and the, somebody died and they called 911. And, and it took them, they, got, they, they carried almost everybody out before they finally found which one was dead because the church was so dead. <laughs> hey, let's never get that way at Faith Center Church, amen? Had a guy from out of town last week and goes to a conservative denominational church and, and uh, he says to me, he says, man, I don't fall asleep during your sermons. I said, Okay, good. That's, I guess that's good. I guess that's positive, you know. So Jesus said this. Jesus came to the, this is Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, saying, Who do you men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And some, some say you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, or Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, You are, are the Christ. Christ means the anointed one, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I'll say unto you that you are Peter. Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. One translation says, Whatever you allow here on earth will be allowed in heaven. I think the church needs to rise up in our authority and not allow some of the stuff that we're allowing. Amen? You know, go to the Philippines, and you know we have a, a work over there, and and 180 churches over there that we help Pastor Paul do, and and um, and it's not uncommon for me to walk down the streets and get propositioned by somebody, by some you know 15 year old kid that I should is if he wants, do I want his 11 year old sister for, for sexual reasons? And I'm thinking to myself, when I'm over there, I think to myself, where's the church at? Where's the church? Whatever you allow will be allowed. Where's the church rise up and take its place and not allow some of this junk to go on? The church has to rise up and take its place. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 says, But you have come from Mount Zion, a city of the living God, the heaven of Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of the sprinkling that speaks better than the things of that of Abel. I like this one in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you might proclaim the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light who was once not a people but are now the people of God who had not obtained mercy but now you have obtained mercy and then my favorite scripture of all all time I've got this on my wall in my house and it's Romans 5 17 for if by one man's offense death reigned through the mo the one much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life by one Jesus Christ I think that we I see things differently I think we're supposed to reign over cities and we're supposed to rise up and and you know, and make a difference in cities, and not just be um, laid back. You know, hope that Jesus comes, satisfied with what we have. Uh, someone said in our men's Bible study this 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 week. They said um, they said the 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 most selfish position a Christian can take is, Lord, I just want enough for me and my family. That's the most selfish thing a, a Christian can do is Lord I just want enough for me and my family sounding humble but really being stupid and the reality is what we need is enough for our families and enough to do something else enough time enough love enough money enough uh, everything everything we need we need abundance of everything so that we can influence our city for the kingdom of God I believe that God, faith center is called to do something significant in this city and in this region and it's time we rose up and did that so what we've been doing is we've been doing a series of lessons and we've been taking the first three chapters of the book of Acts and just kind of seeing because 
uh, that's, when the, that's when the church began to function as a whole. It's not when the church necessarily came into play, but that's when the church began to function as a whole. And so by the law of the first mentioned, there's seven, ways, seven biblical rules that we use for interpreting the Bible, and one of them is the law first mentioned. The first time it's mentioned in the Bible is generally the way God wants it to be throughout, that, throughout, um, the, throughout the time. And you can find that a lot in Genesis, but the first time we see the, 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 the church mentioned in the book of Acts is the way God wants it to be. And so the first thing we talked about is God wants us to do something in outreach. He said, go into the city of Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. He says, then I'm going to pour out the Holy Spirit upon you. And he says, you're going to be witnesses in Judea and, Jumeria, uh, Judea and Samaria and all the uttermost parts of the earth. We're supposed to be witnesses. And then last week we talked about how the church started off in a prayer meeting. And I thought, you know, I just, I guess I was made my assumption I was wrong, but I thought that we'd have a few more people at prayer this week. And actually, we were down in numbers this week. I was just like, really? You know, I thought, I thought I'd get a few people to come out and pray. Well, I'm doing it at home, Pastor. Are you really? Are you really? Maybe you are, but most people don't. So the church is open from 6 to 8.30 on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday for you just to come out and pray, seek the Lord. It's not organized. You just come in, the music's playing. I just thought maybe we would rise up, and I just think that America is kind of a, a prayerless nation as a whole. Yes, we pray, but not to the degree that many other nations pray. So the next thing I want to talk about is in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1 through 4, where they started interacting with the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about this a little bit that God spoke. He said in chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, he said, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them with divided tongues as of fire, and one sat on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, it goes on to say, and I'll skip a few verses here, and we'll go down to verse 14, because he's talking about the work of the Spirit. And he says, but Peter's standing up in the with the eleven. This is after the Holy Ghost had come upon him and all these men heard, these guys were speaking in tongues and, and all these guys heard them speak in, in uh, their own language. It doesn't mean said they spoke in that language, it just said they heard them speak with that language. It was a real supernatural time. And Peter standing up with the eleven raised up his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words for these are not drunk as you suppose since it's the third hour of the day but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, your young maidservants and maidservants, and I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, and blood and fire and vapor of smoke, and the sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon into blood, before the coming great and awesome day of the Lord. It shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, there's an experience called the baptism of the Holy Spirit where people were filled with the Spirit and they began to utter these crazy languages and Paul called it the tongues of men and of angels. Now again, the law of the first, you know, we don't see anywhere in the Bible that this is done away with, so the law of the first is just God wants us to continue on right with that, I believe. But there's an experience called the baptism of the Holy Spirit that's subsequent or after salvation. Many people believe and, and I, forgive me, uh, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little bit in-depth teaching today, a little in, more teaching today. But many people believe this is when the church started, was the day of Pentecost, and when the Holy Spirit came on them, they believe this is when the church started. But that's not true, because in, in John chapter 20, and I don't have time to go into it, but in John chapter 20, verse 19 through 23, Jesus breathed on them the Holy Spirit. And so the church actually started when Jesus was rose, rose from the dead, he breathed on them the Holy Spirit. Now, there's another experience called the baptism of the Holy Spirit where they were filled with the Spirit after that. And let me show you, there's five different incidences, and I'm going to try to go through these real quick because I want to get down and just, and I want to talk about the Holy Spirit today. And that's something we could do for 52 weeks, so I'm trying to, I don't want to rush it, but we might have to, you know, continue on with it next week. But there's five different incidences in the book of Acts and where they were filled with the Spirit. And let's see about this different language thing. Let's see if what the apostles thought about all this different language stuff. Did they, did they pray in these, what they call tongues, or actually just different languages is what they, was there an experience like that? Well, we know from, there's five different incidences, and let's just go through the five real quick. 
In Acts chapter 2, verse 4, we know that, we just read that, they, began to, they were filled with the Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. And then we have an incident in chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 19. So let's go to chapter uh, 8, if we will, because this is an interesting chapter that proves my point. And again, I, I think it's 99% of you believe this, but I just need to, you know, just establish something. So in Acts chapter 8, and verse 5, this is an interesting story because Philip was an evangelist, and it says, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. Notice he's going down and preaching Jesus to them. And it says, The multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And that's really, Philip was an evangelist, and the... Um, one of the fruits of an evangelist are miracles. That's why Howard and Leslie, when they go to the, you know, the, I believe they're evangelists, and they go to the, you know, different places, they get amazing miracles. So Philip went down to the city of Samaria, preached Christ to them, and says, For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed, and lame were healed. And there was great joy in the city. And there was a certain man called Simon, who previously practiced sorcery in that city, and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is, is, is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them and his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip, and he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. And when the apostles, now notice this now, now verse 19, remember they preached the word of God, now notice this, I'm, I'm teaching here, they preached the word of God, they preached Christ to them, people got saved, and, and then, man, there's great miracles happened, but then notice this in verse 14, it says, now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, Jesus is the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might be filled with the, or receive the Holy Spirit. So, one incident, they were saved, and here they, but then they prayed and said, well, we got to go down and get, get them that experience called the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We got to go down and minister that, that other thing to them. So they went down there, and he says, for yet he had fallen upon none of them. They only had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw through the laying on of the apostles' hands that the Holy Spirit had been offered, he offered them money. Now notice this now. In Acts chapter 2, they, they spoke in those other languages. Here it doesn't say that they spoke in those other languages, but what does it say? It says, when Simon saw, what did he see? He had to see something. Probably see him spoke in those languages. Laying on the apostles' hands that the Holy Spirit was offered, he offered them money. Saying, give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter said to him, Your money perishes with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. For you have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right with the things of God. The word matter here is a very interesting word in the Greek. It's the exact same Greek word that's found in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4 that says they were all be began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The word matter here is the same Greek word, utterance, in Acts chapter 2, 4, as here in this chapter. So he says, you have neither part nor lot in this utterance. So, just doing some teaching here. In Acts chapter 2, they were, had this language that they spoke these other languages. In Acts chapter 8, it doesn't say that they did, but it infers that they did. Acts chapter 9, verse 1 through 19, I don't have time to go into it, but... Um, I just, I, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all verse 1 through 19, but you can read it. And Paul was struck down on the road to Damascus, and uh, he became blind, and, and very interesting story here. He's, you know, Jesus says to him, he says, why are you kicking it? Why are you persecuting me? Isn't it interesting? Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? Because he was persecuting the church, and Jesus looked at you as the church. He's persecuted him. And so then he comes along, and he says, we're, he says, we're going to, this guy comes along and says, that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Spirit. Now, it doesn't say that he spoke in those other languages, but we know that he did, because in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he says, I, sp I spoke in those other languages more than all of you. So we know that Paul did that. I'm, I'm hurrying here. Acts chapter 10, verse 44, says this, 
While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who had heard the word, and those of the circumcisions who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the Gentiles, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. So that's obvious there. And one more, and then we'll get into some other things. Acts chapter 19. For five incidences in the book of Acts. The evidence is overwhelming that when you're filled with the Spirit, there is an evidence called that other language thing, or they call it tongues, but whatever. And in verse uh, 2, the Bible says, Then said, do you, do you, Did you receive this Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Unto what then were you baptized? So they said, Unto John's baptism, which was a baptism of repentance towards Jesus. And Paul said, then, then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Jesus Christ. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. So five different incidences in the book of Acts where they were filled with the Spirit. Five different instances where they filled with the Spirit. Two of them infer, three of them just flat out say it. So as the church began, I believe God wants us to do this. The, the way I believe that you interact with the Holy Spirit is just by giving God give you that prayer, that prayer supernatural prayer language that will just infuse you. Jude 20 says building yourselves up on your most holy faith praying in the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 talks about edifying yourself by praying in those other languages that he's talking about. God will give you a, a prayer language if you, if you want. It's not, it's not essential to heaven but, why, but he says I'm going to abide with you forever. Why wouldn't you want it? I believe that for me it's been the greatest blessing of my life that knowing that I can pray, and, and we, got so, we could talk about this for so long, but there's so many times when you just don't know what to pray for, and you just, God will just give you that, that prayer, just that, that, that intercession for people that you pray for. So there's a, a language out there that God will give you to infuse you with His Spirit, and there's something about people, I've never heard it, I, I've been at this 30, I've been pastor now almost 31 years, and been born again for 34 years. Can you imagine pastoring after four, being born again at, for three years or four years and then pastoring a church? How dumb is that? This wasn't very smart. But, I, but I've had a lot of people, be, sad to say, say, people said to me, you know, I'm sorry we came to Faith Center. You know, well, you know, I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry, you know, I'm sorry I married so-and-so. You know, I, you know, that's a bummer, you know. I'm sorry I took that job. I, I'm sorry that, that, you know, that I, that I, got that relationship. I'm sorry about that, but I've never had anybody say, I'm sorry I got filled with the Holy Ghost. Nobody ever has ever said, man, I'm sorry I'm filled with the Spirit. There, there's just something about the Holy Spirit that when you're working with the Holy Spirit, I owe everything I am or ever will be after salvation to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I am where I am today because of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So I just wanted to make that known. Now let's talk about the Holy Spirit and how we that's the way we work with him and we pray in the spirit and different things. I want to encourage you to be filled with the spirit. Now let's talk about the Holy Spirit for a second here. Jesus said this in John chapter 14, and we'll spend a little bit of time over in those 14, 15, and 60s of John, so if you want to get over there for a little bit. Jesus said this in John chapter 14, verse 16, says, I'll pray the Father and he'll give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Now there's another incident right there where he said, the Holy Spirit whom the world cannot receive. Can the world receive the Holy Spirit of the salvation? Of course they can. But you have to be born again to receive the Holy Spirit. So he says, whom the world cannot, because, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. I'll not leave you orphans, I'll come to you. Now, here's an interesting thing. The, the word here, he says, I will, I will give you an, uh, another, the word, I believe the King James says, I'll give you another comforter. Now, the word another is a very important word. There's one Greek word for another that, and I'm not a Greek scholar at all, I just can learn from Greek guys that are. But there's one Greek word that says another, it means of a different kind, and there's another word translated another that means of the same kind. And this word is the one that means of the same kind. So he says, I'll give you another comforter, he'll abide with you forever, of the same kind. He's the same kind as, as who? As me. It, talking about Jesus, as me. He, I'm the, he's the same kind. Now, I'm going to say something that's going to shock you and throw this out and um, 
take this for however you want, but there is no scripture in the Bible that says that the Holy Spirit will convict the Christian of sin. There's no, there's no scripture in the Bible that says that the Holy... People always say, oh, the Holy Spirit convicted me. There is not one scripture in the Bible that says the Holy Spirit will convict the Christian of sin. And we've, we passed off the Holy Spirit as kind of this conviction, put heavy condemnation on us. When he's uh, uh, the Spirit, he's, he's like Jesus. Jesus had compassion on adulterous people. He had compassion on people. He was a... He's like Jesus. He just, if, you, if you want to know how the Holy Spirit operates, just look at how Jesus operates. It's interesting to me that, you know, in John chapter 14, and, and you have to read John chapter 14, but it's interesting to me that at the beginning of the chapter, uh, they, you know, they start asking these questions. I mean, Jesus is about ready. I mean, he's about ready to be crucified. He's about ready to leave this planet. And he's going to turn it over to these disciples that are ask, they're still asking, where are you going? Where are you going? And Jesus said this. Oh, this, no, watch this. He said this. In John, in, he said, it is, it is expedient or it is essential that I go away. Because if I don't go away, then the Holy Spirit will not come to you. So he says, it's essential. Now think about this. I don't know about you. But if my choice was Jesus in the flesh and Vancouver, Washington, I would pick that over the Holy Spirit. But apparently Jesus said he didn't value that way. He said it's more important that I go away because the Holy Spirit will do greater works in you if, because he'll come in you. So he's saying that the Holy Spirit in you is more important than me being here in the flesh. Wow, is that amazing or what? So it's better. He said it's better for you. It's better, for church, that you interact with the Holy Spirit him dwelling in you personally than it is for Jesus being here in the flesh. Man, we, we just, the, the depths of the Holy Spirit are amazing. He said this. Uh, he said, uh, John 14, 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, who the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring things to remembrance, all things that I say to you. Now, the, the, it's interesting that the, the Holy Spirit's job, one of his jobs is to teach us all things. We've got to get to the place where, uh, where we don't depend upon the Pastor Glenn Johnson for our spiritual feeding. This should just be a, a, a boost for you. But the Holy Spirit can teach you things right out of the Word of God. And we shouldn't depend upon our pastors only for our spiritual feeding, although that's part of it. Our, you know, our young people, things like that, our young Christians coming up. But if you've been around 10, 15 years, you ought to be able to feed yourself. And you should be able to, you know, you should be able to get revelation. Now, now the Bible is an interesting book because the Bible is spiritually understood. It's not a, it's, if you read it with just a carnal mind, you won't understand the Bible. But if you understand the Bible through revelation knowledge, and that's what the Holy Spirit does, it comes to bring us revelation knowledge. Let me give you a, a situation like that. Um, so many times over the history of Faith Center Church, the Holy Spirit has given me revelation knowledge on something that we've literally just changed our church and the direction of our church. And I could probably tell you five or six different incidents. It was recently, I mean, recently, I say in 2010, January 26th, 1.15 in the, in the morning, before I discovered melatonin, um, <clears throat> 1.15 in the morning, I was woken up with four words that changed our church. And, and it was a financial thing, but he said to me this. He's, I, I, was, I was asking the Lord. I said, Lord, what is the deal with this whole recession? We're going through a recession here. We've been in a recession since 08, and here we are a year, you know, a year over a year into this thing because it was just the first part of January. And, and the Lord, through revelation knowledge of his own doing, spoke four words to me that, that literally were doing what we are today because of these four words. And he said this to me. He said, the tithe is holy. The tithe is holy. And that came by revelation knowledge to me. And literally, if you could hear the hundreds, I don't know, I won't say hundreds, many, many tens and tens and tens and twenties and thirties of testimonies that have come from this congregation because of those four words that the Holy Spirit gave me by revelation. The testimonies that have come because of that, and businesses have prospered and families have turned around because of the tithe is holy. It's been amazing. The turnaround of our church, it was fascinatingly amazing and it's because 
the Holy Spirit taught me those things through revelation knowledge of his word and then of course I delivered it to you and it became revelation many of you have ignored it and that's fine and and, and no I mean it is it's fine you can do what you want it's not a heaven or hell issue you can do what you want but many of you've taken heed of that word and it's and it's begun to prosper you amazingly and it's it's been it's been great no condemnation to the people that aren't because if if if, if you want to stay that way that's fine that's there's just no condemnation to that but the Holy Spirit gave that to me by revelation and there's many incidents over the over the history of Faith Center Church where the Holy Spirit has given me by revelation that teaching where it's not just you're sitting down and teaching, but he's given you revelation knowledge of something that has, you've walked on that word. And many of you have received that many times where, you know, it's, for me, it's like one of those things where, you know, I, I can go out and I can just, you know, say this or speak that or whatever. But you know what it's like when the Holy Spirit gets you that word or that building's yours or, or that car is yours or that revelation is yours and you know man you know that you know that you know when the Holy Spirit gives you that by revelation when he teaches you that revelation there's not a devil in hell that can talk you out of it there's nothing that can stop you and the Holy Spirit wants to work with us through revelation like that and dreams and visions and I see our church this church I see the church rising up and and I've seen it for 30 years but I, I just now coming to pass where you know, I mean, I, I didn't see this part of that, that whole drug rehabilitation thing and, and going after people that are on drugs and answering the question about, about you know, getting people off addictions. And, and I just talked to our staff and I said, this is the direction we're going. And then all of a sudden, you know, there's a vacuum and Bill and Vicky got sucked into our life because of that. And, and it's just like, okay, that's the vision. The Holy Spirit, by revelation, gave us that. And then Bill and Vicky come, and now we have this service, amazing service. And there's guys weeping before God at the altar and different things on Saturday nights. Women weeping before God, and they're putting down their drug. And just, it's, it's amazing. But we get that by the Holy Spirit just giving us a thought, a vision, a dream. Now I can see where we're going to have to have, like, a hospital for people like that. And We'll speak all over the world and, and, and tell people how, you know, here's the, here's the thing, guys, and I'm just sharing my heart with you, but, hey, this is, this is the bottom line. This is what Faith Center was all about for years. And I, I, to my detriment is we were answering a lot of questions that nobody was asking. And I think the church as a whole is asking a lot of questions that absolutely nobody's asking. And now we're answering the questions that the society's answering I mean, can I have a good marriage? Is it okay? I mean, can I, can I, I hate her right now, but can I, can I love her eventually if I get a hold of the word? Yes, you can. Your life can change because, the, and we, we have that here at Faith Center. Marriages can be changed by the power of God. Can I get healed of cancer in this place or is there no hope and just make some tapes and send me on my way? Well, as long as I'm the pastor of this, we're going to believe God for healing for you. and We're not going to compromise. We're going to, we're going to hang on and believe God that God wants you. And we get that by revelation knowledge of the Word of God. The Holy Spirit's our teacher, man. He's, a, he's the one who will come to you and speak to you and give you revelation. He gave me four words that tithe is holy, and from that came a whole book and teaching and all kinds of stuff, and it just downloaded, just like, boom, downloaded at me just all at one time. It's just like it just sucked all this information, just came, and it took me three weeks to explain it in a teaching. The Holy Spirit's amazing. And he'll give you a dream and a vision, and many of you, have a dream to become something in your life and do something you say well I don't know if I could ever do that when are you gonna realize guys that God purchased God loves you so much and believes in you so much that he sent his only son to die for you and he thinks you're quite cool and he thinks that you can accomplish the vision that he's placing in your heart right now he thinks you can accomplish that so I don't think I could well now you've got it if you only knew me and how much in, insecurities and fears I've dealt with over my life and phobias and different things and different things, and I just thought, well, you know what? I'm just going to forget all that stuff. If God believes in me, the last person I would call to pastor a church is me. If, I, if, if you put me on a list of people, I would have been the last one. Self, I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not even saying, I'm saying this as sincere as I can be. If you give me a list of 10 people, mine would have been at the bottom, off the list. There's no way that I could ever do this. When the Holy Spirit gives you something, man, your dreams and the vision that he's given you, he'll teach you something. The dream that he'll give you is probably way bigger than you ever thought of. Well, I just want us four, no more. I just want enough for my family, not me. 
I want to take as many people with us to heaven as we can. I want to change this county. I want to, when, when we, we what, what, hey, hey, when, we, when I die, when I, want, when I die, I, I picture life like this, and I'm, I'm just done here. But this is the way I picture life. What does my funeral look like? Well, I picture my funeral. Here it is. Can't hold in this building, not enough room. Well, that's kind of bragging. Well, now hear me out. Probably the Memorial Coliseum doing my funeral. Because I want to help that many people and affect that many lives. And I want my wife to get up and say, I want her to get up and say, you know, he was a great husband and a great leader in our family. Not to say, I don't want her to say, my God, I'm glad that jerk's dead. <laughs> I want my son to stand up and say, yeah, my dad and I, we argued all the time, but man, I'll tell you what, he was a man of integrity. He was a man of integrity. He kept his word. He, he was a man that loved his mom and loved my mom and, 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 and helped people. And I want you to say, to, I, want, I want you to in your mind say, man, that guy up there, he made a difference in my life. And then when you see your funeral, then you just live your life to accomplish that. So we as a church are rising up to a new level. And I believe all of you are part of this. All of you are a vital part of our lives. I cannot do this by myself. Matter of fact, I don't even want to do it by myself. You know, as I, when I was younger, and I'm just being honest with you, when I was younger, I thought it'd be so cool to be on television and the paper. And, and I was in the paper a few times. They'd ask me stuff, and I'd cut out the articles. And there's been quite a few articles about our church recently. And, you know, with Bill and Vicki and Taryn and, you know, different people. And, and there's been several articles. And, and my name was not mentioned one time in those articles. And I told the staff, I think... I'm finally doing my job correctly. I think we finally got it. That my name was not mentioned in one of those articles. I think Faith Center has started to arrive. Because this cannot be about me. This has got to be about you fulfilling your destiny and the plans and purpose that God has for you. Come on. business owners I need you what, what do you need from me do you need my prayer <laughs> let other people pray I need your money we need your finances we gotta we gotta we gotta build we gotta build buildings we gotta we gotta build hospitals man we gotta we gotta we gotta get we gotta build man you can pray too. You know what I'm saying. I say I think say th stupid things for effect sometimes. Please pray for us. But I need you, business owners, to rise up like never before. I need you to rise up, and you have a vision. You've got the vision. You've got it. And you and somehow there's been a negative, and you thought, well, I don't know if I should, you know. And and and, and some business owner buys a new house, and the first thing they do is they want to explain to us, you know. Well, I got a good deal on it. We don't care whether you got a good deal on it. God's blessed you. So what? So what? Do you understand what I'm saying here? This, isn't a, this is about us as a church moving as a, as a unit together, all of us saying, I'll take that spot. I'll take that spot. I'll do that. I'll take that. I'll be that worship leader. I'll write those songs. I'll teach those children. I'll be the business guy. I'll help with the rehab. I'll be, help with the youth. I'll do this over here. I'll do this over here. I'll do this over here. And when it's all said and done, we stand before Jesus. He'll look at us all and say, hey, you guys are pretty cool down there. You guys, well done, good and faithful servant. And I guarantee you that if you're called to nursery and you do the best job you can, I guarantee you that Jesus will look at you and he'll give you the same reward as Billy Graham or me or anybody else because you were obedient to the call that God had you do. The Holy Spirit will give you those things. And if your dream isn't shocking, ridiculous, and big, it's not the Holy Spirit. Because if you can do it, then it's not the Holy Ghost.
mind shocking, ridiculous, and huge. Are you with me, church? Can we do this together? That's what the church is all about. I got more to say, but no time to say it. No time to say it. Did you get anything out of this today? Next week, two services. Let's fill up those two services quick, and then we'll get going on some of this stuff. And Come on, let's rise up and say, man, I never heard anybody talk this way. Yeah, I've never heard anybody talk this way either. I'm not sure it's right, but, but it's cool, right? Ah, boy, there we go. Some of my hunting partners were complaining about me squawking, and so I just, I'm trying to get down there just acting like I'm 22 still. So, Did you get this today? Can we do something? Man, if you'll fulfill your place, say, well, I don't know. I, this part that I have doesn't seem significant. I just have to show up and, and, and do a camera. Hey, that's significant. I got to show up and be in the sound booth. I got to show up and be an usher. I got to show up and do this. And you think that's not significant? It's very important. It's very, very important to us. Because without that ministry of helps, the, the ministry of the word cannot go forward.